Hello, it's time for the storytelling stage again for 15 minutes between uh, the two breakout sessions that we have between 1 and 1.45 and 2 and 2.45. And we wanted to use these 15 minutes to invite an organization, one of the organizations that we have here, um, non-profit organizations that we have here, um, because we want them to be part of the Women in Tech Network as well, because they're super important. Uh, this network is the one that we're ha having on stage right now, is Tjejer Kodar. And with me here today is Hanna Pettersson. Welcome up on stage. <laughs> Woo! Are those your friends? Thank you. yep. <laughs> yeah. They work with me. Yeah, okay, your colleagues. <laughs> They're paid. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> to be a great audience for this. <laughs> Good. Good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm have fine. you been here the whole day? Yes, and listen I have. To talks? Yes. Have you been inspired? Yes, very much. Very By much. whom? Everyone. Ever. Yeah, everyone pretty much. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great day. Good program. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Well, so I'm biased yeah. because <laughs> I made the program. Yeah. <laughs> but is there anything particular that sort of spi uh, sparked something in your mind? Um, I think the social, the the one, uh, the short, the Susan from um, what's it called? The social. Uh, oh yeah, exactly. Because uh, it comes in very much what we're working. You. Exactly. Yeah. Her like the report that they've done and the research that they do it comes very hand in hand. Well, the kind of same problems that we see as well. So I thought that was uh, that was great to see someone else say the same thing as we do and have uh, m even more numbers based, based saying the same thing. Do the numbers actually make a difference? I sometimes feel like so many people are showing so many, like actually producing reports, mm. yearly reports. Mm. We have stats, we have so many arguments, we have research, mm. and, and sometimes it just feels like nothing is enough to convince the people that should be convinced. Yeah, I, I agree to one extent. I mean, we really still report ourselves, and I certainly yeah. hope that they do make a change. Otherwise, uh, it's a waste of resources in a way. But I think, though, it's very hard to argue with the facts. You can't really argue with her, for example, that uh, women have the same uh, possibilities or opportunities in an interview, for example, looking at that. Um, so I in a way, I think you can use it to persuade companies maybe to take another action. Yeah. Um, but then you also need to be a bit open for it, um, obviously. Yeah. You already mentioned that you published um, a producer report. Mm? Tell us about sort of the scope of that. Why did you decide to... Um, to do it, and you did a survey mm. among 700 women and non-binary people. Yes. Uh, did you actually did you collaborate with anyone, or is it a Shea Kodar only report? Um, basically, yes. We have a pretty big, like we're one of the bigger networks for women in technology in Sweden. Uh, so it's based on our own network, but it's people that span everything from professional programmers to people that are working in tech on other roles. And uh, basically, from junior roles to senior. Yes, yeah. it's like everything in between. Um, and we've been working uh, in this industry, both like working at companies, but also running Shea Coder. Now we run something called Technigo as well, mm -hmm. and have been doing that for many years. And we see these kind of problems uh, coming up. We also help women to get jobs in tech, and we see these kind of issues coming up over and over again. And um, for us, this report was a way of, of proving that a little bit and to see how big is the problem actually? Is it just something that we like? Do we see, or is it is it actually a real problem? Yeah, and is it actually a real problem? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what yes. do the numbers say? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, no. So we asked uh, like 700 women, or like we call the 700 voices, uh, both kind of more statistical questions, but also let them actually explain the situation. And we had uh, people going through the kind of stories that they've been they, they've been telling about how their situation at the workplace is. And I think there's some things that are wor a lot of things are worrying. Uh, and um, kind of the biggest worry is that I think 53% says that their skills or their knowledge is not taken um, uh, seriously, seriously. Uh, that they get questioned at work. And uh, I in think a in a way that men don't. It, in their experience, men don't. I mean, we haven't asked men. <laughs> I wish we had a, a killer quota as well that we could compare, but we don't. Uh, but the, in the their whole experience, world is killer quota. Oh, I mean, exactly. It doesn't really need to be one uh, at this point. Um, but I think uh, in and another thing is also the salaries. That half of those that we asked are not happy with the salary, and I think it's such. A, Especially the salary thing feels like a very easy thing to potentially fix, 
it's for me it's um, it also comes from a marketing perspective it's like a supply and demand thing i mean we're we're women we're in super high demand in this industry there's very very short there's very few of us yep. uh for me also i know how much companies actually pay recruitment firms and employ branding budgets and stuff to actually find us like here we are <laughs> come <laughs> come find us uh but also like once we actually start like let's pay us so that we stay and that we are happy. It, it just doesn't feel like there's so big, uh, it's not that much money that's needed um, yeah. for this to change. Yeah, so money and also build cultures where yeah. women and non-binary yeah. people feel at home and, yeah. and safe. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about sort of what you actually do. You already mentioned some of the initiatives that you've taken, mm. um, what you actually do to push this forward in different ways. Mm. Um, I mean, Shea Coder in general teach women programming for free. Uh, we do courses, we do events, we do all types of things. Uh, we also, we release this report, which is actually a tool. It's aimed towards companies. So there's like very clear kind of checklists. We talk to experts. There's all types of things in this to actually make a difference at your workplace or for leaders or for HR people, recruiters, whatever. Um, uh, so that's one thing as well. But then we also run something called Technigo, where we actually take people with one career and move them into programming. So we, we let senior programmers train them for half a year uh, and then we match them with different companies uh, to work as developers. And so what type of roles do they come from before that? Oh, Just wow. about anything, like a, a big mix of stuff or? Yeah, it's, uh, it's so wide. Like we have CC over there, <laughs> wave. Yay. <laughs> so you actually reskilled into becoming a programmer? <laughs> do we have, um, yeah, we have a mic. We have Sarah more. with a mic. CC come. Yeah, we <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, actually you can come up on stage, yeah. <laughs> This is not planned. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> you can blow for Sissy Wong. <laughs> and, uh, you used to be a yoga teacher. I used to be a yoga teacher. <laughs> you used to be a yoga teacher. Yeah. I went from being a yoga teacher <laughs> to being a programmer. It's funny That's because right. it feels like nowadays everyone wants to be a yoga teacher. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, way, yeah you know. I did the, uh, the opposite. The opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Yay, yay, okay. Um, nothing wrong with yoga, but we need more programmers as well. Uh, I thought, right? Yeah. It seemed like the next step. So what happened? Like, what convinced you into doing this, this reskilling sort of change in your life? Well, part of it was actually Shea Kodai because I did, um, um, I worked as a yoga teacher and I wanted something to do uh, sort of outside of teaching classes. And I started to sort of dabble a little bit in like web design and that kind of thing, just because of an, you know, it being interested in design. Yeah. And then as I started to learn more, I discovered that there was this huge community of, of women interested in tech. And uh, I, f I found Shea Kodai. And I thought, oh, this is, like, this is so interesting. There's this enormous movement behind this. And uh, then they started the boot camp, uh, Technigo. Mm. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to take the step. Yeah. And it was the best thing I did. <laughs> so amazing. Mm. So uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. I mean, you're the <laughs> daring one here. <laughs> and how long ago was this? This was two years ago. And how, so you are, are you actually in a role now or are you yes. a freelancer or working at a company as a programmer? No, I'm a consultant and I've been uh -huh. working as a front end developer since I left the boot camp, basically. That's so inspiring. Very inspiring. Yeah, uh, but, but yeah. also to, to say uh, you, you come from a yoga background, so like, but we also have people more from leadership uh, backgrounds, uh, design, uh, sales, marketing. I mean, basically everything. I think what what's really required to get into this industry as a programmer is more the passion and the drive and inspiration rather than what you have previously. And then your previous skills can be matched with, for example, in our case, front-end development or other types of developments in various ways. Uh, some are easier to match than others, but you always have kind of, you know, skills in your backpack that you will bring into this new role that are valuable, like leadership skills or just, you know, knowing I mean, if you worked a lot uh, many years like you, you you know how you work you're not fresh from school in that way um so there's many many aspects um and also different perspectives into the actual products that you're building yeah your story actually s sort of um made me think of something that i i think that i usually talk about in my when i stand on st stages and, and talk about the future and what we have to consider um 
and that is the whole reskilling movement. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're considering it too, mm -hmm. duh, because mm -hmm. that's that's what you do with Shea Kodar, that more people in the future and now have to take responsibility for their own reskilling and mm -hmm. sort of instead of having one long like having one degree and one long career um, identifying as, as one thing, mm -hmm. a programmer or a yoga teacher, uh, you might be five different things, work with five different careers. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned that companies mm -hmm. aren't there yet or some companies aren't there yet and they still sort of want to see your CV and they mm -hmm. still evaluate you based on sort of old principles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what's your thought? I think one of the biggest problems in uh, in the kind of lack of competence and also recruitment in tech today is that you have this kind of mental image of who you're looking for. You like have a specification almost that they need to have an academic degree, they need to have this and this and that, and maybe even specific university. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly, and uh, and preferably you programmed since you were five years old and you played games, you know, like all these kind of really stereotypical. Uh, the things that you think about programmer. So when we bring people that often or most likely have switched their career, none of these things fit uh, ever. Uh, and the kind of challenge is to to make companies believe in that and kind of completely skip this this list, and which is very hard because there's no fit in their in their mind. But what we see, we've done this for many many years. We see that when they they can do the job equally good. Um, so that that should be what you evaluate the person on, not in a recruitment process, uh, not uh, not uh, the kind of specification you're looking for in the beginning. So what should the recruitment process look like if you get to design it? Mm, I think um, one issue that we see very, very often is that we, because uh, we match, uh, especially uh, female programmers with companies, and uh, we, so we send them to an interview, uh, and then quite often the recruiter comes back to us and says, no, sorry, they're, like, uh, they're the two junior for us, we don't have the support system to support this and whatnot. Because uh, in the first initial step, they're like, oh, great, women, like, t let's take them in on interviews. And then, like, oh, no, they're, they're too junior for us. And then I always ask, okay, so did you, did you view the code? What, what did you actually see? What was the problem? Uh, I thought this was more of a, the first step, so it's like a personal kind of culture fit. And they were like, yeah, they were great on that, but like they, they did two juniors. So, but did you see any code? Uh, and they hardly ever look at any code. They just judge people in that room. And, and that it bugs me because uh, it makes me so frustrated because like, can we please look at the things that actually matters? Uh, so I think in general, I would love to shift that around. Those companies we work with that actually send the people that we work with to tech tests first, uh, they normally they in much higher rate get the job in the end. Um, and that's the same stats basically as Susan showed as well, that, that women tend to, because the people you meet in this interview, they have had five years at KDH or Chalamesh or whatever, uh, and they sit and think like, how can this person do my job with not, that doesn't have it at all the same background or experience that I have. So it's hard to, uh, to come past that bias. Yeah. So companies have to update their view on what competence is and how they uh -huh. actually test that. Uh, and also realize that, as you say, reskilling. Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I also worked uh, with marketing for um, uh, with job ads previously uh, at, at uh, one of these platforms. And it's quite often that, that they were looking for stuff like you wanted five years of experience in this language, for example. And it's quite often we had to call them up. Like, no one, no one fits this match because this language has not existed for that long. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, it's so fast, everything. Um, so, so that's also you looking for people that can rescale faster and faster and faster. Exactly. Th those are the people you want to find. The curious people who they keep being are. curious and want to learn. Uh, and they will never fit that specification because, no. uh, oh, yeah, it's not how it looks like. Unfortunately, we're on, on overtime, but yep, thank no you worry. so much for joining us. You're here. Yep. Uh, where can we find the report? Uh, it's on shakeholder.se uh, yep. slash report, but I think it's also pretty much on the and first page. A lot of articles written about it, if you want to sort of yes. make it quick. Yes, also search yeah. Jake, or a report, and you will find some, some okay. great stuff. Thank you so much both Thank you. for joining us. Thank you.